All right, and welcome back everyone to what is going to be our final video of the semester. Now, sad day. Uh, we are going to finish with some flair here. Uh, what I'd like to show you is, like I teased at the end of the last video, uh, what is the most, probably the, the most ubiquitous object in dynamical systems theory. We are going to show, uh, we're going to talk about the snail horseshoe. Now, the whole idea behind uh, this, this object and this construction is that we are able to uh, create very complicated dynamics, even from very simple objects or uh, simple systems, uh, simple operations. So some of the most simple actions that we can take, uh, that we can impose, are repetitions of shuffling and folding. So if you think about uh, folding or sorry, shuffling, those would be like the uh, like mixing problems, and this would lead to questions of uh, living within the theory of ergodics. And uh, folding maps; these are going to be kind of stretch and fold dissipative systems uh, in general, right? We want to be able to shrink wrap uh, shrink, shrink wrap our space around a certain set and show uh, show chaotic dynamics, so that we wind up with strange attractors. And uh, this is something that Smale was studying about the same time that uh, that Ed Lorenz, uh, so Steve, Stephen Smale, who, by the way, is still alive. Uh, I believe Ed Lorenz actually died a few years ago, but Stephen Smale, I do know, is still alive as of the recording of this video. Uh, but he was studying about at the same time as uh, Lorenz. Uh, he, was, he was actually looking into a whole bunch of dynamical systems theory, and uh, he effectively created along the way a proof of uh, of the Poincaré conjecture for dimensions five and higher uh, in the smooth case. So basically uh, he, he proved a, uh, a very very hard problem. He proved uh, not a millennium problem but he did prove a very very difficult outstanding problem from the uh, 20th century in, top, uh, in top, uh, topology. So, specifically, what he was looking at was actually not too far removed from uh, from those kinds of uh, those kinds of ideas, but he was looking at uh, simple dynamics. He was looking at ways to kind of create the same sorts of dynamics that uh, Ed Lorenz saw in his continuous systems from a uh, from a discrete map point of view, and what he wound up proposing was effectively the uh, the Baker's map, which is a like a fold and and stretch, a stretch and fold map. And what we can how we can see this is that we are trying to create this uh, this this idea of pulling, stretching and pulling this box. So we're trying to turn uh, S here, which is this square. So I wrote it down as D, but anyway. We are trying to stretch and fold this guy so that uh, we can move forward or backward at, in creating horseshoes. So we're taking this solid line square and turning it into a horseshoe, which is all the way over here. Well, so it's there. Uh, or we can go backwards and take, uh, take this, or the other way, the other perspective is to take this horseshoe, which I will make a concerted effort to draw better than the last one, and map it to this dashed line square, right? So it's just a matter of trading off which thing you're trying to turn into a square and which thing you're trying to turn into a horseshoe. And you can play with this at home if you have Play-Doh or Silly Putty uh, or uh, people, what are people looking at online now? They're doing, uh, they're looking at slime, they're making slime. Uh, so it's kind of a fun thing for kids to do these days. Uh, so you're welcome to go ahead and try check out this map on your own. It's uh, it's not too hard to understand what's going on. You're just stretching and pulling and reshaping everything so that you wind up with horseshoes and squares. So unlike the notation would suggest for moving this guy forward or backward, f and f inverse, these two functions on the square, are not functional inverses of one another, right? Neither one of these guys is onto, because you, you notice 
that there are pieces that are missed over here on either side of the square, so we don't even have the same domain uh, necessarily for these functions. Uh, and even so, parts of our parts of our square are mapped outside of the square when we move forward. So it's it's not quite uh, what we're it's not quite what we're looking for in terms of a function. So what we would like to do instead is consider what happens if we iterate this map many, many, many times, both forward and backward. And what winds up happening here is that we keep uh, contracting this, uh, this horseshoe into a smaller and smaller space. And if we restrict the domain far enough, there is a limiting set, uh, which surprisingly enough, go figure, we're gonna call it lambda again. There is a limiting set here sitting inside of the, the square where uh, whereupon f and f inverse are now functions and or they're not just functions they are functional inverses to one another so it's not the the stretching and folding map here that we see on the square that we want to look at we look we want to look at the at this uh, repeat repeated folding and and, uh, and stretching being done on this limiting set uh, lambda and Kuznetsov actually gives a really good picture of uh, of what this limiting set is uh, starting to look like if you just keep iterating this map over and over you get kind of this checkerboard pattern and you want the checkers checkerboard pattern to intersect itself you want to keep creating uh, smaller and smaller subsets of this guy and what you wind up with is something like a uh, something that is a cantor set uh, in the in not not the cantor set but a cantor set uh, and this is effectively going to be another uh, another version of uh, of a fractal, another another instance of a fractal. So once again, the dynamics are not defined very explicitly, but we do have a general geometric idea of what these guys are doing. And we are going to try to study this folding this this uh, this horseshoe map by the same methods that we did, that we had just worked with in the previous video, we're, or the previous two or three videos at this point, where we are going to try to find a homeomorphic uh, phase space for this, uh, for, for instead of working on lambda, we're gonna work on something else. And we're gonna show that this horseshoe map is conjugate to a different map, which we can more easily understand on the new space. So, Smale's insight was to identify these points uh, of lambda, so the points that are sitting in this uh, limiting set in the square. Uh, he's going to map these guys not onto sequences, but onto bi-infinite sequences. So, in the previous video, we were working on uh, sequences moving like a, a semi-infinite sequence. There was a definitive starting point S0 to the sequence, and we kept iterating forward. But... We are allowing for our sequences now, instead of just moving forward, uh, they can now move backward as well. There's a There are two tails to the sequence. And specifically, we are still going to be uh, working with binary sequences. So it's still symbolic dynamics. So these S, uh, S sub J uh, digits here are going to be zeros and ones again. And uh, notice that when I'm working within, with a bi-infinite sequence, I have to put this little dot in here, or I like to put this little dot in here to remind myself where the center is, quote unquote center of the sequence, right? Where is the S0 term of the sequence? Otherwise, there's no way to find out this. This is an isotropic uh, object, so there's no way to figure out where, uh, no way to distinguish between any two uh, locations in the sequence otherwise. So... The identifying uh, home homeomorphism that we're going to make now is going to follow the same pattern that we uh, that we constructed in uh, in our in our discussion of the logistic map. So, so we are going to talk about uh, creating these sets in the forward direction. We're going to get horizontal, or sorry, we're going to get vertical sets in the vertical uh, in the in the forward direction. So we get these v1 and v2 sets, right? If I were to complete the horseshoe it would look something like that, right? So this is the idea that we are uh, restricting ourselves to these two vertical strips, V1 and V2, in the forward map, and we can continue iterating that where we wind up with even smaller versions. Uh, and if we iterate in the backwards direction, we're gonna get this horseshoe instead, 
right? So we wind up with invariant uh, H1 and H2 horizontal bars. Awesome. So we're going to construct our uh, itiner or our homeomorphism, uh, much like we did the itinerary maps from the logistic uh, logistic map study. Uh, we're going to say that the digit s sub k is going to be equal to zero, or yeah, it's going to be equal to zero if uh, if the kth iteration in the forward direction of this point x by y is in the f in the uh, the horizontal. Sorry, should it be h one? It should be in v one. Is that right? Yeah, it should be v1 and then v2. There we go. If this guy eventually lands in uh, the vertical strip v1, we're going to give it a zero. If it eventually lands in the in the in the uh, v2 strip, we're going to label it two. So, very very similar to our itinerary maps from before. We will omit the proof this time. So go ahead, unclench. It's okay. Relax your shoulders. Take a deep breath. It's okay. We are going to take it as fact that this h function taking uh, the set lambda onto these, uh, this omega set of bi-infinite binary sequences is a homeomorphism. And in order to define that homeomorphism, remember we need to know what continuity looks like. One way that we can uh, impose uh, open sets here is by constructing a metric space or creating a metric on these bi-infinite sequences. And sure enough, we're going to create exactly the same metric from before, but we're going to extend it in the backwards direction for the indices as well. So when we uh, when we outfit or when we furnish omega with this new metric, we actually wind up uh, making omega by d into a metric space, whereby we can go ahead and define continuity, and we have a, a well-defined notion of what a homeomorphism should look like. So. Once we get to this point, we've identified a new phase space, right? Lambda and, and omega are the same phase space as far as we can tell. Their objects might look a little bit different, but they behave the same way, topologically speaking. So now what we need to do is show that their dynamics, the dynamics between, uh, between the Smale horseshoe map and some other map is, uh, are conjugate. We need to show that the dynamics are the same. So we look for a conjugacy between these two functions, or find a function that is conjugate to f. And maybe not so surprising at this point, uh, we're looking to the shift map to create that conjugacy. Right? And the shift map this time, it's still going to be a right shift. Where, so we're going to move that, that point that denotes the middle of the sequence over to the right by 1, so that we shave off, the or we move the starting point over one index to the right. So it is, again, the shift map. That we're going to show that, uh, it, or that we that we are going to go ahead and say, is conjugate to f, and we've already shown the vast majority of the work. It's just a matter of shoring it up to make it make it look nice for uh, bi-infinite sequences and for uh, this new uh, this new map f, this new Smale uh, horseshoe map. But again, the proofs look very very similar, so we're not going to go through them again, and instead we can go ahead and just jump to the conclusion that this shift map is once again chaotic on it on uh, sigma or not on sigma on omega and that means that because f and uh, sigma are conjugate through the uh, through this homeomorphism upstairs uh, this, this itinerary mapping that not only is uh, is the smale folding map the smale horseshoe map uh, a chaotic or chaotic on uh, it not only not only does it exhibit chaos, we can we can identify this uh, limiting set lambda as a strange attractor, right? So because the uh, because all these all these uh, folds here are contracting the the uh, the area, they're making the area of the horseshoe smaller. So we are indeed creating a volume contracting map or an area contracting map, which means that solutions want to tend toward this lambda as we map forward. So that would mean that this is an attractor, and it's an attractor that uh, exhibits chaos, therefore it is a strange attractor. And if we call this map in the construction the Smale Horseshoe, and maybe the more, uh, more important 
uh, thing to note about this is not just that this map exists, but that other systems actually have this map living inside of it. Strangely enough, this is the case for perhaps another two most commonly cited systems uh, in dynamical systems theory. We have the Hanon map on R2, and it's a discrete two-dimensional map. Uh, and we're going to use parameters A and B that are given uh, where Hanon used these particular uh, parameters as he studied it. And we also look at the Rossler system. So the Hanon map we'll see downstairs in a second here, but the Rossler map should look very familiar to us. It should look like the long lost cousin of the, of the uh, Lorentz system. That this guy supposedly, right, this system supposedly looks simpler because it only has one nonlinear term, but it's actually remarkably harder to study than the Lorentz system. So just to give you an idea of what's going on here, both of these systems have strange attractors in them, right? And how do we show that? How do we know that? Well, these guys both establish their chaotic nature when you identify where the smale horseshoe lives inside of these maps or inside of these phase spaces. So in order to show that we have, uh, we have such a construction where we have, where we have such, a smale, such a horseshoe map, we need to prove the existence of a trapping region. So things need to, orbits need to come in, right? Particles need to eventually wind up inside this region so we can keep squishing it and folding it over and over and over again. So both systems demand the existence of a trapping region. And this is, uh, harkens back to our study of the Lorentz attractor. For the Hanon map, we can see where this, uh, where this folding map or where this trapping region takes place or where this trapping region exists. And if we map forward far enough, we can actually see, <laughs> strangely enough, we can actually see the, the stretching and folding of a horseshoe map, which to me, I think is actually kind of hilarious that we can actually find this exact object. It may be skewed a little bit, but we actually see in this boomerang an ex almost an identical carbon copy of this horseshoe mapping. There is no reason in hell why that should have happened. Like the fact that this almost looks identical to what uh, what uh, Smale uh, came up with in his horseshoe map, it's, it's nothing short of a miracle. And more, uh, probably maybe a little, a little less uh, surprising, if we run some numerical simulations here of what the Rossler system looks like or what it does as we kind of make these uh, these circuits around the z-axis, we see what's, uh, what we can only describe as uh, kind of like maybe uh, what you would do to sheet, uh, what you would do to sheet pasta or, or puff pastry dough, right? You're, you're just stretch you're folding this thing over on itself, flattening it out, folding it over again, flattening and folding, flattening and folding over and over and over again. And that is perhaps a little more obvious that we, uh, that we should expect a horseshoe to appear, but there's something, something that we need to establish for this three-dimensional system, right? I mean, it's, it's obvious that Hanon exhibits a, a smale horseshoe. So clearly, whatever this thing is attracted to has to be a strange attractor because we see the smale horseshoe in that system, and the smale horseshoe is a chaotic system. But it's a little less obvious what to do here in the three-dimensional system. I mean, smale's construction is two-dimensional inherently. So we need to find a way to take this three-dimensional map and bring it down a dimension. And well, Poincaré map? Yeah, not a bad idea. If we take a Poincaré uh, section carefully here, we can see exactly that smale horseshoe and it's exactly what's being illustrated in Strogat's uh, illustration here, Strogat's uh, picture of what happens when we try to fold this guy over and over and over again. We can see the horseshoe if we take the, the appropriate, uh, appropriate slice of that sheeting. And sure, yeah, we see it on the Poincaré section, but maybe more surprising, we can actually see uh, the logistic map if we take a double section. So we take a section of the Poincaré section, and that shows that we wind up with uh, 
a line, a dynamics on the line here, and we see a Cantor set show up in, uh, in this system. And we effectively wind up right back where we started with the logistic map and showing that that guy was uh, conjugate to the shift map and the shift map is chaotic and yada, yada, yada. So this guy is in some sense doubly or doubly guilty or doubly chaotic. So it's actually really interesting to go and pursue these, uh, these, these interesting fundamental examples because there are very few uh, known routes to chaos. So because we have such a hard time finding or creating uh, chaotic systems or establishing chaotic systems, we need to find a way to study a broad uh, selection or a broad category of dynamical systems. And in order for us to do that, this technique of, of passing to a different phase space and then showing the equivalence or the conjugacy of the dynamics there is a very common strategy to, uh, to show that systems are chaotic. And honestly, that's the bottom line here, that chaos is hard to establish in, in a general setting. There are very few examples that we know for a fact are chaotic. So what we try to do instead is push the problem uh, that we have, whatever experiment or uh, problem that we're dealing with uh, or comes up in our, in our own research, uh, we're going to show that that guy is conjugate to a system that has certain properties. And that is uh, one of the key ways that we show that systems are chaotic, is to show that they look like something that we know. And from the past few videos now, like this entire introduction to, cha to chaos, uh, I hope has been enlightening and uh, showing you that even though this is a very difficult thing to study, that there is light at the end of the end of the tunnel here, and that uh, you that you gain a newfound appreciation for how difficult uh, how difficult it is to study these uh, these seemingly simple uh, operations and dynamics. And for the course on the whole, I I uh, I, I came into this with uh, next to no expectations. I mean, I had high hopes for what. Uh, what we would do in this class, and I think we have covered just about everything I wanted to cover. Uh, and my goal for this class was to instill in you this uh, this appreciation for something that's outside of the uh, the standard curriculum for a lot of institutions, but is a uh, is a set of skills that I think you will find useful uh, as you move forward in your careers, as you finish your degrees. And if you wind up going into research, maybe this will be interesting to you where you want to pursue it even further. So I hope that uh, that, that uh, theme came across and that you were able to use this, uh, this class as you go forward. I wish you all the best in what you, what you pursue from here. And there is no next video. So I will just end by saying thank you for sticking with me for the semester.